Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, thank you all for being here and, you know, brave in the rain. Obviously, some people didn't. <laughs> you know, New Yorkers, when it rains, it's like it's raining razor blades. Everybody runs away. <laughs> uh, uh, we're supposed to be so tough. Uh, I want to thank the Washington Square Institute for having us. And a big thanks to the um, Historic Preservation Society, not just for organizing this, but for working every day to keep them from knocking down everything there is in Greenwich Village and the East Village. <laughs> you know, every time I hear they're going to knock down another nice old building, I think, you know, why don't you knock down that new one, that ugly one that you just built, and try that again before you knock down one of the old ones. <laughs> All right, so um, my book is A Cultural History of Greenwich Village. I'm just going to do a kind of flyby through it. Um, there's, it's in much more detail in the book, obviously. And um, I, I want to start by saying, you know, in its heyday, Greenwich Village was called the most famous neighborhood in the world. Uh, for centuries, it attracted and was a haven for artists, political radicals, life adventurers, gays and lesbians, and misfits and outcasts from around the country and the world. Coming together in this tiny, tiny little speck of the vast American landscape, they bounced off each other like subatomic particles in an accelerator and created tremendous amounts of culture for America and for the world. It's worth noting, I think, at the outset that um, the artists and the bohemians and the intellectuals and the radicals were always a minority and often a transient minority in the village. And there were other much larger and arguably more stable communities in the village that guys like me writing books like this don't always mention. So um, I tried to make sure that I got them in the book. And I want to just say a few words about them before we move on to the artists. Um, through much of the 1980s, the village was the center of black Manhattan, which is something I think a lot of people don't know, um, especially around the Minettas. Uh, it was called Little Africa, or if you were an Irish cop, you called it Coontown. Uh, Stephen Crane and Jacob Rees wrote about it, but more importantly, uh, the black community itself in the village created the first black newspapers, professional black newspapers in America, and had the first successful professional black theater in America, what's, what's said to be. Uh, it was called African Grove. It was at uh, Bleecker and Mercer Street in the 1820s. Pretty briefly, because white hooligans uh, at first were amused by the idea of, of an all-black cast doing Shakespeare. And they did a lot of Shakespeare. They started with Richard III. Um, but then they started acting out, the white guys in the audience, and it, it didn't last very long. Um, nevertheless, one of the stars, a man named Ira Aldridge, um, moved on to London and had quite a successful career as a Shakespearean there. He did Othello, of course, but he also did a lot of other characters, uh, Shylock and Macbeth and others, in whiteface. Yeah. Um, there was the Irish West Village, the waterfront village and, and, and the western end of the village um, that inspired the movie On the Waterfront, although it was uh, shot over in Jersey. It's, it was inspired by the village and Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen waterfront. Um, the Irish Village also gave us one of the most colorful, if not necessarily one of the best, mayors in 20th century in New York City, Jimmy Walker, and, uh, and a world champion boxer whom I think could only have come from Greenwich Village, Gene Tunney in the 1920s. Gene Tunney was a boxer who read Shakespeare, who was good friends with George Bernard Shaw, who talked about the science of pugilism. And this was a time when, you know, boxers tended to be lugs and mugs. Uh, the press, for the longest time, couldn't tell if he was a hoax or not because he could speak whole sentences. <laughs> and then there was the Italian South Village, another huge um, community from back when Little Italy wasn't just two blocks in the middle of Chinatown, or what a friend of mine down there calls Little Chitaly. Um, <laughs> but went from the Bowery all the way over to the village. It was a very large uh, community. It gave us another one of our most colorful and I think most loved um, mayors of the 20th century, uh, Fiorella LaGuardia. He didn't grow up there, but he was born there, then grew up in Italy, and then came back. Um, and one of the most colorful mobsters, uh, Vincent Chin Gigante, the Daffy Don. Uh, and then there was the Wasp Village. Uh, um, uh, it's probably not the nicest way to say that. That's a, but anyway, the, uh, the Wasp Village, um, the Patrician Village, the upper class village um, around and north of Washington Square Park, Henry James's village. And all those communities ex coexisted at the same time. And, and the artists and bohemians would sort of come and go. But 
But I do think it's the artists, the bohemians, the radicals, the gays, the lesbians that made the neighborhood famous and I think made it unique. There are a lot of nice neighborhoods around, but there really was only one, Greenwich Village. Um, that, uh, that what, what I said earlier about its function is, as a magnet for artists and a haven for misfits and outcasts went together for a very long time. I think it, it's easy to kind of forget now that in most of America, until relatively recently, until the 1960s or 70s, if you were of an artistic bent or you wanted to be, God forbid, a poet or, uh, or you were gay or lesbian, um, or you had radical political ideas, you were probably a lonely misfit and outcast almost anywhere you live. But there was one place that everybody heard of, this place called Greenwich Village, this magical place where, where you could go. And a lot of people fled to Greenwich Village from everywhere around the country and then also from Europe um, and found that they were not only among other people like them and were not only allowed to be whoever they were, uh, as outrageous or idiosyncratic as that was, but they were encouraged to be, and they were encouraged to act out, and that's a long tradition in the village, acting out. Um, and the outcasts, its, its function as a haven for outcasts goes all the way back to before Greenwich Village was Greenwich Village. It goes back to the 1600s. Um, the Dutch West Indies Company uh, puts a few, a tiny little settlement all the way down at the bottom of Manhattan in the 1620s. By the 1640s, it's still only 500 people down there, and all the rest of Manhattan is bogs and, and forests and meadows and hills and streams. It's the wilderness. Um, by the 1640s, there are a couple Dutch farms out this way, but not much else, um, except for the natives. And, and um, one, of the, one of the native settlements was at Sapo Kenenkan. It was uh, where Gansford Street is now in the village. Um, in the 1640s, the Dutch gave many of their African slaves what they called half freedom and little plots of land that they strung like a necklace across the island from the village over into what's now the East Village. Um, and they grew, for, grew crops for themselves and gave some of the crops to the settlement. This was not the Dutch being good to their slaves it was as it was sometimes portrayed. By the 1640s, even though there were only 500 people in uh, New Amsterdam, they had so ticked off the Indians um, by, among other things, by leading what could only be called terrorist raids on, on Indian settlements in Manhattan and in, and in New Jersey, that they feared that an all-out war was coming. And in fact, it would come in a few years. So they put their slaves out there as a buffer zone and, uh, to, you know, and an early warning system for when the Indians came. You know, they, there's that saying, you can tell who the pioneers are because they're the ones with the arrows in their backs. Um, and okay, so and then that tradition of, of, of it being a place for outcasts continues. Uh, Newgate Prison, which was in effect the first Sing Sing, was at Christopher and Greenwich Streets in the 1790s. Um, through the 1700s, yellow fever, cholera, other plagues um, run through that tiny little community down at the bottom of, of Manhattan uh, every summer. And uh, Washington Square Park, in fact, starts out as a burial ground for yellow fever and cholera victims because um, it was far enough out of town. But the village was also where you, one of the places, uh, it was out in the country. So you would flee out to the village to get away from the, the plague. Um, by the 18, especially, there was an especially virulent plague in 1822, and it's that year that people started building permanently in the village. And one of the reasons that the West Village is so famously or infamously the streets curl around on each other and wander all over the place is because people were building along the cow paths and the farm paths and the streams, and uh, then it just stayed. By the 1850s, when the grid, the avenues and street grid of Manhattan, flows up and around it, it's too late to change all that. So the village always maintains this villagey, slightly anarchic uh, mess of streets over at that end. And that becomes part of its charm, obviously. People find it charming to this day. And part of how it gets marketed as ye olde Greenwich Village, you know, in the 20th century. Um, more misfits and outcasts. I, I got some more. I got, I got a million misfits and outcasts. Uh, in 1804, Aaron Burr was living in Richmond Hill, which was an estate, a nice house, uh, up on a hill, which is no longer there. The hill got flattened. Um, in the South Village, uh, down around King Street and, uh, and Van Dam, um, when he crossed the Hudson and went over and had his duel with Alexander Hamilton and shot Alexander Hamilton, came back to Richmond Hill, then fled Richmond Hill the next day, fleeing a murder rap. So 
um, because he had in fact killed Alexander uh, Hamill. 